For communication theorist Harold Innes, the bias of communication is more than just bias in content. Innes believed that the bias lies in the media itself, drawing striking similarity to the work of his colleague Marshall McLuhan. Innes coined the term monopolies of knowledge to describe a monopoly not necessarily over knowledge itself, but over the means of its communication. Throughout history, new technologies have created new opportunities for communication and culture. In fear of these opportunities, those in power have often tried to control the technologies and, as a result, restrict the spread of knowledge. Before the advent of paper and the printing press, religious authorities generally had control over knowledge. Texts were professionally hand-copied onto parchment by scribes, a laborious and expensive process. After copying, the materials were often kept in monasteries and church libraries, hidden from the public. The spread of alternative knowledge was quite restricted, keeping a top-down system of power in these societies. Two other concepts central to Innes' work are what he called time bias and space bias. Time bias media carry long-lasting messages and favor tradition. Since they tend to be local, they only reach a small audience. Innes was very focused on oral traditions and how early societies were able to keep stories alive for generations simply by repetition. Play tablets and hieroglyphics are also time biased because they cannot be easily transported, meaning they must remain within their communities. Space bias media are able to convey information over large distances, but they are short lived and favor secularism. Unlike time bias media, they tend to reach a large audience. This is what mass communications are considered today. The printing industry alone has become increasingly space biased, from the printing of literature to the daily and now online newspaper. With the rise of mass communication, Innes saw Western society as being obsessed with the present and losing the potential of tradition that he admired in oral societies. He noticed the potential for mass communication to shape public opinion whether in the hands of the government or public relations professionals. Although he saw newsmakers granted freedom of the press, he saw that freedom challenged by a dependence on advertising and government support. Innes passed away in the early 50s, several years prior to the launch of the internet and especially its widespread use for personal communication. What can be said today about monopolies of knowledge and of the bias of communication? Like the beginning of the printing press, the internet was idealized in the 1990s for its democratic potential. It was open, unregulated, and didn't have borders. Today, like freedom of the press, freedom online is decreasing. Who controls information online? Whether obvious or not, hierarchies exist on the internet. Much like how government organizations control radio airwaves, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers is a private organization that allocates domain names and IP addresses. And although the Internet is still quite free, we are limited by its infrastructure. Anyone can make a website, but markup languages like HTML have predetermined boundaries that users need to work within. Even social networking websites put limitations on what we can do. For instance, Facebook users can only choose between two genders, male or female. Search engines are also controlling how content is found. Websites like Google and Facebook have algorithms that cater your search results and newsfeed to what they think you want to see. This puts a big importance on things like search engine optimization, incoming links, and even paid results. Many governments also center content in more explicit ways. This morning, security forces were setting up across the city, and internet and cell phone communication had largely been shut down. The uprising has been organized by young, well-educated Egyptians, like law student Ahmed Salah, who knew how to harness the power of social networking. The call to action for the massive demonstrations on Tuesday went out to more than a million Facebook users. The call was then massively repeated on Twitter. They also censor in less explicit ways by creating legislation. Bills like SOPA in the United States aim to restrict uploaded and downloaded content. Proposals like usage-based billing aim to give telecom companies more power over pricing and to limit internet accessibility. Bill C-30 in Canada and new cybercrime legislation in Australia give governments the power to monitor online communication. 
However, Wikileaks is one example of the democratic powers of the internet. Like the press was originally intended to do, the organization aims to hold governments accountable for their actions. It is also an example of those in power fighting back. In late 2010, PayPal and MasterCard stopped the flow of funds into Wikileaks accounts, citing that they didn't support its illegal activities. Much like early restrictions on the printing press, the internet is leading governments and corporations to try to limit and control communication online. If Harold Innes were around today, he would consider this a struggle over monopolies of knowledge and, in effect, a bias of communication. Like McLuhan's concept of the global village, online communication has managed to defy space and is in the process of redefining time. Innes' fear of early mass communications in the West has been amplified by online communication and its immediacy. Space biased media have reached a peak in the era of online social networks and an obsession with the loss and search of time.